Welcome to the last session of the day at Marxism Festival. Um, my name is Sophie Squire. I'm a member of the SWP in Newham, um, and I'm going to be chairing uh, this meeting. Andrew Tate in cells, is there a new misogyny? So um, you might already know how the meetings work, but I'm just going to explain it to you. So Sophia here will speak for 30 minutes, um, and then we will have discussion for about the same time, and then Sophia will come back to sum up. So. Um, I actually haven't introduced Sophia. So Sophia is a member of the Central Committee uh, of the Socialist Worker Party. So I'll, I'll bring it over to you now. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Awesome. Well, look, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, I know we've got some 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 big names I'm competing with today uh, on the in the timetable. <laughs> Uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed Marks and Festival so far. Look, I'm going to start this. Oh, there we go. It's the site. We were having a problem with the side show already. Right. I'm going to start by assuming. I'm going to start, I'll start by assuming everyone knows who this wanker is in the room. Don't worry. 6 p.m. is like Marks and Watershed cut off, so we can say what we want in this meeting uh, within reason. Um, this is a photo of Andrew Tate uh, on his arrest, right? He was arrested, so I should say as well, a bit of a trigger warning for people in the room. I am going to be talking about uh, sexual assault and abuse and so on a little bit in this in this meeting, just in case anybody uh, wants to leave or feels uncomfortable with that. But um, Andrew Tate was arrested for rape, human trafficking, and forming an organised crime group to sexually exploit women last December. And just last week, he was officially charged nicely in time for this meeting. Uh, but unfortunately, right, his arrest is not the reason reason why people had already heard of Andrew Tate. Uh, before this, Andrew Tate was arguably one of the most famous men in the world, uh, at least amongst uh, teenage boys. In 2022, he was the most Googled name following the question, who is? In autumn of 2022, a survey taken of 14 and a half thousand teenagers in America, um, he was ranked the number one influencer amongst teenagers. That means he came above people like Kanye West. Uh, for the younger people in the room, he came above uh, Mr. Beast. Uh, for people who don't know who Mr. Beast is, Mr. Beast is a YouTuber that has a massive combined view of 42 billion views across his uh, YouTube channel. Um, and actually, anyone else you can think of. The hashtag Andrew Tate on the streaming service TikTok alone received 10 billion views in just one year. So look, well, why is there something to worry about? Why should we be concerned about the rise of someone like Andrew Tate? Um, and his arrest didn't come as a surprise to many, actually, because he bragged about these crimes online a lot. And look, despite the sort of humorous circumstances of which his arrest took place. Uh, that is the only thing to laugh about, about Andrew Tate, right? You know, uh, they, I'm not gonna read it out. Allegedly, some sort of Twitter spat went along uh, with Greta Thunberg, my new hero. Um, he replied in a ridiculous video uh, with pizza boxes. Apparently, this is how the police identified him. Uh, I don't think it's true, uh, but it's a nice thing to start about, uh, to, to laugh about, because there won't be much more laughter, I think, after that. Uh, look, Tate was famous, as I said, for boasting online about his abuse of women. He is famous for posing with cars, guns, and Cuban cigars. Um, he has a pyramid scheme named Hustlers University, where he teaches people to invest in crypto, uh, to go to the gym, and to develop derogatory ideas about women, LGBT plus people, and actually other men who don't sort of fit into this toxic masculinity stereotype. Um, he calls himself the alpha male, the top G, um, and essentially a self-help guru in probably one of the most contradictory of ways. The only person Andrew Tate has ever helped is himself. And look, I think Tate is not an anomaly as well, we have to say, right? He straddles a dark and backward community online known as the Manosphere, um, which is an online community which is hard to gather really how many active members it has, but it could have hundreds of thousands of people online talking about these things. And Tate is not the only one who's getting rich and famous out of spouting misogynistic and right-wing views. You've got your Jordan Petersons, your Alex Joneses, your Ben Shapiros, the list goes on, right? Uh, but the Manosphere extends far beyond pseudo-scientists and reactionary podcast hosts. And despite what people believe, it doesn't just exist online. A um, hundred women have been murdered in the name of incel ideology in the last 10 years. But what I really want to make a point here um, to begin with is that however horrifying these crimes are, statistically, the most dangerous figure in a woman's life is not someone like Andrew Tate or an incel online, um, but actually it's somebody that, that they know. Uh, in this country still, an average of two women a week are murdered by their current or ex-partners. The most dangerous place for, for women in society is not an online chat room, it is in the home. 
But to go back to the manosphere, right, it can sort of be categorized into four main groups. First, you've got your men's rights activists. These big people basically think that women's rights has gone so far that men's rights have been left behind. And, you know, some of them campaign for it. Some of them just complain about it. You then have a movement called men going their own way. Uh, they have this sort of same basic claim that women's rights have gone too far. Men are the ones who are oppressed in society. But they say that this is like unsalvageable, right? And that they think men should just sort of, you know, remove themselves from modern society. Uh, you then have the pickup artists. Uh, these are a group of people who give uh, people tips and tricks of how to get women into bed. Um, and I think it's quite important to note, right? They see women as like a fixed species with a, like a separate species with a fixed psychology that they claim that they're sort of like masters of manipulating. Um, it's not like, it's, this isn't just about like cheesy pickup lines, like, oh, your dress looks nice, it'll look better on my bedroom floor kind of vibes, right? Like they're not teaching people to do that. They're actively teaching people to like manipulate and, and emotionally damage quite a lot um, of women. And look, then of course you have uh, the incels, probably the most famous and most extreme of the manosphere. If people don't know, incel is sort of short term for involuntarily celibate i.e. they see themselves as groups of men who want to have sex but aren't having sex because no one wants to have sex with them. Um, to be honest, there's a whole array of different views in the insult world that I don't have time or the will to, to explain, to be honest. Uh, but in a nutshell, right, they think that women are in control of the world. Um, there isn't a patriarchy, there's a gynarchy or gynarchy, however you pronounce it. They think that women are merely motivated by good looks and money and that this is why many teenage boys who sit in their room alone uh, can't get a girlfriend. So they think women are merely sexual objects and they appeal to these sort of quite backwards and biological arguments about sexual attraction and reproduction and a natural hierarchy of life. Um, and they think that men have a right to sex and because they aren't getting any, they don't just blame women, they actively hate them. Uh, and I think it's worth noting as well that they see this sort of natural hierarchy. Incels view themselves at the bottom of their own hierarchy amongst men. That doesn't mean that they don't see themselves as so far superior to women. And it's also worth noting that whilst all of these groups can be seen as individual, they intersect entirely, they interact with one another online, and much of this can be seen as a sort of like process of radicalization. Some people start off with the pickup artists and extend into incel ideology. Uh, if I could, sorry, go to the next slide. Most of these men consider themselves red pilled in reference to the Matrix films. Uh, what this means is they think that they have taken the red pill, uh, they're the only people who are actually woke in society, right, and have woken up to the ideas of what the world is really like, in which women's oppression is a myth, and that men are the oppressed people. I think it's quite funny, right? It's an ironic reference, like, clearly the fact that the trilogy is made by two trans women and has, like, you know, really important leading role, female roles, is completely uh, lost on them. So look, though, where does Andrew Tate fit into all of this? Um, to be honest, Andrew Tate doesn't fit into any four of these groups that I've just gone on to. And Andrew Tate really only rose to prominence in the last six years. Um, no one really knew who he was before 2016, 2017. He kind of forgot, became popular after he started posting diatribes about the Me Too movement online. Um, he compared women getting raped to him leaving a million dollars on his doorstep as, um, and it getting stolen. He attributed both as simply a questionable of irresponsible decision making he says quote pretending women are blameless pretending women are blameless and men shouldn't rape is stupid he says uh ironically in 2017 he moved to romania from britain um part of the reason was this was that he thought he was less likely to be charged for rape in romania so see how that's worked out for him but he said actively um that uh he moved out of britain because the me too movement in britain had meant that quote women at any point in the future can destroy your life now look i don't think i have to go through this meeting there's lots of meetings about the police and the state, but I don't think Me Too has gone far enough. Um, all you have to do is look at the statistics, right, of rape conviction. The Metropolitan Police do not take it seriously, right? So I've actually got more faith. Anyway, no, I'm not going to say that question. But, um, anyway, so look, all in all, Tate and the Manosphere, they claim that men have never had it so bad and women so good, uh, if only, right? Uh, I don't think I need to convince people in this room that sexism is a very real thing in society. So then I think the question we have to answer is how is it that Andrew Tate's ideas 
and have such purchase? How is he so popular amongst young people? Well, look, there is a different side to what Andrew Tate says online as well. Uh, people's first interactions with him will not be some of the most disgusting things he says about women. Um, actually, he usually talks about sort of bettering yourselves, you know. This is what he says he does. I seek to help men overcome poor mental health for embracing hard work, physical improvement, and shared masculine brotherhood. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe we were just taking him out of context, right? You know, he talks about things like having to work a bullshit job as a teenager for exploitative bosses, bullshit, you know, these things people are angry about, um, you know, in society. He talks about male expectations, about being the main breadwinner in the family, having financial success and control over your own life. You know, we know that capitalism means very little people actually do have control over their own lives. You know, he tries to find a way to explain the disillusionment that a lot of people feel in capitalism um, and actually and the anger that people feel when the expectations they have of what they should be in society don't match up to that. You know, Tate gives them someone to blame. Um, and look, some people may say he's not that bad. But then he also says things like this, so maybe he is. Look, uh, in many ways, right, men all across the world are suffering. But they are not suffering at the hands of women. They are suffering at the hands of a rotten system. I mean, think about the mental health crisis that men face. Uh, suicide in this country is still the biggest killer of men under 50 12 men every single day in the uk commit suicides men are faced you know lots of challenges concerns about body image isolation loneliness and you know all at the same time there is this constant pressure to be hypersexual hyper masculine you know teenage boys are told that everybody's out having sex and if you're not doing it there's something wrong with you you know these contradictory ideas all the time are fed to young people about what they should expect from society and what their lives should be like and when many of their lives don't match up to this sort of unattainable standard people can feel angry they can feel self-hatred and many blame women um, but look, it is not men that are in crisis rather the system is whether it be in the form of economic crisis the cost of living inflation recession whether it be climate change or war and actually when a system is unstable like our one is today it constantly has to find new ways to reinvent and justify itself um, and actually this is something i think that andrew tate has tapped into and to be honest if it's anyone who's under attack in society it is women think about the attack on abortion rights think about the violence that i spoke to think about the roots that are going on in Iran and I think actually as well this isn't just about an attack of individual male violence when it, it is a systematic and a structural thing that women's oppression exists in society you know when it comes to economic recession and austerity actually it is women who have to pick up the pieces of these things we are expected to look after family members when health education and care services are being cut um and actually, then you begin to see that these gender roles that are forced to us all the time on capitalism, you know, they are key in shaping what we are expected to do in society. And I think that being said as well, whilst men may suffer at the hands of expectations and gender roles, they are not systematically oppressed by them. And um, that has something we have to be very clear. Women, on the other hand, are systematically oppressed under capitalism. That is because of the structures on which our system needs in order to survive. It's because of things like the institution of the family that will get onto a little bit back, a little bit later. But it is the role of women's oppression that helps to produce profits and keeps the system churning. So women are oppressed. Men may suffer at the hands of gender roles. It may be distorting for them, but does not oppress them. So look, to go back to that, I just want to see what the next slide is, sorry. Okay, right. Uh, to go back to the question then of is there a new misogyny, right? Whilst the phenomenon and reach that someone like Tate has, or the visibility of groups like incels has can seem a bit frightening, there is actually nothing really unique or new about the ideas that he espouses about women. Um, we see them time and time again. There's certainly there's certainly nothing new about sexism or misogyny. Look, so I mentioned how Tate and incels could sort of be seen as a rise out of a backlash to the Me Too movement. But this happens time and time again. Um, every time women have made gains in society or any oppressed group for that matter, there is a pushback against it. Look, there was a pushback against the sexual liberation movement of the 1960s. It's a tiny, tiny thing. But in the 1960s, women got the pill. It was socially acceptable to say that women could have orgasms and that we enjoyed having sex. What did the capitalists do? They thought, this is great. We'll use it to sell people more stuff, right? During the 80s and the 90s, you saw a backlash of the so-called career women. Uh, 
younger, whereby, you know, more and more women were entering the workforce. This meant that there were changing roles that men and women were expected to do in the home. And some people argued that this drove a crisis in masculinity. Um, you know, so these ideas that Andrew, Andrew Tate spouses, they're not new. They come up time and time again. You know, the advancement of the so-called career woman was seen as a threat to men's place in society, but also the home. So as you can see, you look, as long as women will fight for rights that we still do not have, there will also always be vicious backlash against it. And look, quite frankly, right, um, there is also today an attack, like I said, on women's oppression. Um, and there is a re-emergence or a reinforcement from the state and the top about women's roles, particularly in the family. Uh, that's because actually, if you think about the nuclear family, uh, many people can't afford to live in one, surprise, surprise. You know, if you think about the expectations that men are told that they're meant to have to be the male breadwinner, to have this financial sex success, this house and kids and so on, people, many people can't achieve this. Um, if this is something that we all wanna achieve, right? This is what, they want us to look like, right? You know, the harder we push for liberation, the more the bigots will try and push back to put us in what they think is our natural place. It's this, isn't it? That's, that's women's natural place. To be nice, smiley, it's in the kitchen and in the home. So look, Tate's ideas are not new. He is a symptom of a sexist system that has the ideas that he has structured into it. So then, if it isn't Tate or incel forums that are the cause of these ideas about women, well then what is? Sexism is absolutely everywhere in society, um, and that means there's lots of different explanations about where it comes from. Some of you might have just been in the meeting on is biology the root of women's oppression? I don't have time to go into that, but I think just quickly, if anyone wasn't, there are quite a lot of people who say that sexism is an age old thing, that men are from Mars, women are from Venus and you know these different ideas that people have are just sim simply a result of biological differences between men and women to be honest that's a pretty uh hopeless strategy right because it means what well, what are we going to do about it can we never get rid of sexism sexism is that what's what people are saying um but I think we have to try and reject this argument because actually it's had a bit of a rise over the last few years not just in the form of transphobia but actually this is what incels and Andrew Tate say right they talk about a Actual biological hierarchy between men and women. They say that men's brains are bigger. They say that men are stronger. Women are inferior. You know, the world would be nowhere without men, blah, 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 like all of these things. That's what they say. So, of course, we have to reject these ideas. And actually, we have to have a material understanding about where these ideas in society come from. Um, we don't think that there is anything natural about sexism. People are not born with these ideas in their heads. Actually, they are taught from us from the top. Another way to prove this is that actually for most of human society sexism and women's oppression wasn't didn't exist um for many years most of human history we've lived in societies that weren't based on class lines that didn't have gender roles and so on and it was only with the rise of class society and private property that women's oppression came into play now look this is probably the first good news of the meeting right because it means that actually we can fight for a world in which sexism doesn't exist again um but look sexism and the idea Ideas about women, I think what is important to talk about, take a very particular form under modern day capitalism. And actually what we say and see is that sexism is rooted within the institution of the nuclear family which is what this looks like if nobody knew. Uh, society is absolutely structured around the institution of the family. You know, we're told that this is the natural way to live um, and that there are methods that they use to enforce this framework. You know, if you think about mortgages, rent prices, universal credits, and these sorts of things that force people into these collective households, but they use ideology to draw this into us as well. You know, from family values to the toys that little girls are forced to play with when they grow up. You know, we know that ideas are taught from us to us they don't come from nowhere um when Karl Marx writes that it is not consciousness that determines being but social being that determines consciousness this is what he means it is the structures of society how we work how we organize how we socialize ourselves how we're educated how we're raised you know all of this stuff that is what then forms our ideas about one another and also forms our expectations that we have for ourselves well, so then how is uh, the structure of the family the cause of ideas about women and therefore the basis of popularity, uh, the basis of the popularity of people like Andrew Tate and incels? 
Well, firstly, the family is absolutely essential to the economic to, to capitalism because of the economic role that it plays. To be honest, the system does not need every single person out plowing a field or working on the factory floor. Rather, what capitalism needs is people to be socialized, it needs people to be educated, and it needs people to be healthy. Um, and women, by and large, do all of this work in the institution of the family for absolute for free. Um, um, and look, you see it all the time. So if I go to the next slide, people will know this advert. Oh, it's a bit shit quality, but anyway, people will know this advert. Um, but this is what the roles of women in the family are. If people don't know it, this is a genuine government advert that was put out during COVID, right? So this is the role that women play within the home. You can do your cleaning, you can do your homeschooling, you can do your ironing. And after you've done all that, you get to put your feet up with your husband on the day at, at the end of a long, hard day, right? You know, this is actually the idea. That's the role that women play within society. I think it's worth saying that when women aren't doing this work in the home for free, they're doing it and they're getting paid fuck all for it, to be honest, as carers, teachers, nurses. You know, this is our role within society. Um, the unpaid labour that women do in the family and the raising of the next layer of the workforce is fundamental to the workings of capitalism. But the family has another role in capitalism. It has a hugely ideological one as well. Um, it is in the family where women's role in society is laid out and therefore where ideas about women are formed. And actually the ideological role of the family reinforces that economic one, right? It justifies why women should be staying at home. It explains why we should be paid less or why we should be the primary caregivers looking after everyone. You know, it says why the ideological role of the family explains why we have to be not just emotionally available but sexually available all the time as well and i think it's the ideological role of the family that is key to understanding why someone like andrew tate's ideas can have such purchase in society because look tate says that women's place is in the home this is an age-old idea he's not reinventing the wheel here right these are things that we're told all the time and i think it's important as well because out of a backlash of the Me Too movement, a lot of the Manosphere's attacks have a specific focus on the sexual freedoms that women have won. But you know, this is also the name, main narrative that we see all the time, right? Women are objects of desire solely for men's gratification in normal society. You know, these ideas aren't confined to incels or TikTok, to be honest. They permeate society. And I go through this because I think it can be a bit of a contradictory idea. It's not the common sense. When women experience sexism, it is not at the hands of a system. It is at the hands of individual men, right? It is not capitalism that gropes you in a bar. It is one individual. But we have to try and explain why is it that we live in a society where people think that those ideas are okay, where those ideas are acceptable. They come from somewhere. And actually, it's about it being structured and fundamental to the system. And look, when I say sexism, everywhere think about some of the advertising we see i showed you a video of one for the 1960s sexist advertising is not confined to the 20th decade i mean these are just ridiculous they've come out in the last 10 years but it's not just advertising it's other attitudes uh family deals on holidays reality tv programs look unashamedly i am a massive fan of love island for all those who aren't close your eyes to the next slide right but reality tv um, pro reality TV, really kind of things like Love Island, they show the gender roles that exist within society uh, massively, you know, about the expectations of what is attractive. And also you get this trope, which is really all like, I think it goes on all the time, right? People have heard this, nice guys finish last. That's just how it is. This is an incel sort of idea, isn't it, right? That men only care about money and good looks and all of us nice, kids, nice guys finish last. Uh, spoiler alert, in my opinion, he wasn't even a nice guy. Like this geezer was a, he was a dickhead, I thought well, anyway. But look, I think what the reason why I show this is that these ideas dominate in society. They pop up time and time again. You know, gender roles are absolutely everywhere and young people can't escape, escape from these sort of ideas and the expectations that people are meant to have in society. And, you know, what is the dominant idea about what a man should be? Um, what does a successful man look like under modern day capitalism? He looks like that, doesn't he? 
So that's exactly what he looks like. Um, and I think this is something that we have to go back to, right? Because this is what young boys are told that they should be. The alpha male, uh, you know, the one that's always in charge, that's got these horrible shoes and leather chairs and money on the table, smoking stupid cigars. You know, this is what the vision of success is meant to be, right? So you can see why people try and aspire to this, because this is what capitalism tells you to be like, actually. You know, so when Andrew Tate says, like, I am the gatekeeper of financial and sexual success just give me 50 quid a month and i'll teach you how you can be like me of course people are going to respond because people are struggling actually i think he is the epitome of what masculinity is like under capitalism and i think this is an important point to draw out because really it shows the role of ideology under the system that we live the role of ideas the dominant ideas that shape the world because i think tate reflects a broader and growing trend in society um andrew tate like i said takes the anger and the disillusionment that lots of people feel because capitalism is failing the majority of us by the way and he takes that anger that people feel towards the world and he channels that anger right right back into the system. You know, he says, he proposes himself as anti-establishment, right? It's sort of like, you know, I'm out of the mainstream. I used to be poor, myth of meritocracy, sort of get rich or die trying attitude. You know, he says to people, it's your fault you're poor. You're too lazy. Five minutes get, left. Awesome, get to the gym, right? Yeah, I'll be, okay. Uh, get to the gym and so on. Um, you know, he's actually quite like Paris Hilton, you know, in this t-shirt. Um, but look, he's, he's pro free speech, he's anti woke, he's a rampant individualist, but also he is a capitalist. And to be honest, he's a pretty good capitalist at that. And like I said, I think this is a broader trend in society. Um, it's quite a common theme you see amongst politicians like Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, right? They propose themselves as anti establishment or elite. We don't need to remind ourselves what they say about women, too. But actually, when you see that when Marx says the ruling ideas of society are the ideas of the ruling class this is what he means and i think that's how the ideological role of the family can explain the material roots of where these ideas about women rise from because society is steeped in sexist ideas about women how, what jobs we should what do what clothes we should wear what, what clothes we should wear and so on and actually all of these things are used as a justification of the systematic oppression of women so in my last five minutes or so i am on my bit that says just to finish the dominant ideology in society is not just backwards towards women though we have to say this it is racist it is homophobic it is transphobic and actually a lot of incels and Andrew Tate's ideas seep into this sort of society um, as well. And I think is the reason why we have to think, why is it that the right and people like Andrew Tate are on the rise? Well, when people like Suela Braverman and Rishi Sunak say stop the boats, it gives the racists the confidence. When Rishi Sunak attacks trans women, it gives the trans folks the confidence. You know, it's them at the top that push this idea that allow that radical, the radical people to take it off, take it off and run. And you know, Andrew Tate and Intel's they're linked to the far right. This is similar with Mr. Tommy Robinson, both of them are from Luton. So, you know, I think why is it that there is this shift? is taking place in society why do the ruling class feel they need to reinforce the structures and institutions they rely on to stay in power well over the last few years i think we've seen a deep polarization of society we've seen a collapse of center ground politics um we've seen you know neoliberal justifications i'm sweating so much so yeah we see neoliberal neoliberal justifications for the system. I don't think really holds much legitimacy anymore. And the ruling class has to appeal to the right to find sca scapegoats, to direct the anger away from them. It's much easier for us to all be pointing the finger at one another than up at the top. But to finish, it's not as though these ideas cannot be challenged. They are not natural or fixed. As I said, it's not as though every little teenage boy has a mini Andrew Tate waiting to get out. People aren't born with these ideas, they are taught them. And to be honest, Tate has just jumped on a gravy train that's been going round and round in circles for decades. And I don't think then what we face at the moment is a new form of misogyny. Sexism is a tool of the ruling class and a fundamental feature to capitalism. It justifies women's role in the family that has insurmountable economic benefits to capitalism. However, that's not to say that we don't face new attacks. Um, I think Andrew Tate and Incels are very specific to our time. And actually capitalism 
is a, is in crisis. Um, it needs to try and find these ways to survive, but it's also a dynamic system. That's why it changes and morphs and manipulates these ideas in order to try and keep that base and the material root still there. Because people are looking for solutions to the crisis, many are looking for an alternative to the system. Take incels in the far right, they have their own narrative, right? The so-called degradation of society, the supposed collapse of the family, men's oppression, you know, in some ways, they take the anger people face and they give it a pro-capitalist solution. That's what they do. They say the problem isn't the system. It's not the system that you're angry. It's somebody else. And actually, in so ideology has been explained as a no hope ideology. And it is one of no hope. It gives us no hope about the future. And in a weird way, Andrew Tate is an activist, isn't he? Um, where is my next slide? Nice, well, anyway, well, we don't have them on the page when I talk about Andrew Tate still. In a weird way, Andrew Tate is an activist. He tries to explain people's anger. He offers them false advice, saying if you get to the gym or invest in crypto, you'll be rich and happy. He channels the anger back into the system to produce profits. And that means we have to be activists as well. If he's a pro-capitalist act activist, we have to be anti-capitalist ones. We have to be activists of a radically different kind. You know, Tate only rose to out of popularity, as people remember, because of something like the Me Too movement. For all the hate there is online, there is a community of people who rally against it. And not just online, but in the streets as well. Women are at the forefront of fighting back against the system that has exploitation, oppression, and all the other ills that capitalism produces built into it. They don't just fight back as women, they fight back as workers too. These are workers on the RCN picket lines. You know, we understand these are uh, NEU teachers and strikers. These are some Mongo's workers that we saw at the opening rally yesterday, right? You know, these, exactly. We understand that if we want to do away with the backwards ideas, that means fighting together as a class, because oppression only exists to divide us. We, of course, we have to challenge sexist ideas. We have to challenge individuals like Andrew Tate, but fundamentally we want to uproot the system, the mechanisms it uses like the family that actually create the oppression in the first place. It is capitalism that is the basis of sexism today in the form of the family and the ideas that women come, and the ideas about women that come from it. We know that it is only through collective struggle and reorganizing society in such a way that our ideas can change and we have to fight for that. I think to get to that world that doesn't have sexism and oppression at its heart, not only do we have to be activists against the toxic system, but we also have to be revolutionaries that fight for a better one. So thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. Um, just before we go to our small group, I just wanted to flag, flag up that um, Sophia is a contributor to the, our new, uh, new pamphlet, Smashing the Sexist System, um, that you can buy for £3. It's, it's a really indispensable tool uh, that we can use. So, um, and now we're going to maybe go into small groups for about two to three minutes just to kind of talk about what you've heard. So, yeah. I'm sure we've got a lot to talk about. Um, so I want to get in as much discussion um, as possible. So we have um, roving mics going round. So if you want to speak, just put up your hand and I will call you and I will call one after the other. Um, so I am going to start with, um, I'm going to start over here um, on the right hand side and then I will go to uh, you in the middle. Is it on now? Okay. I, I just was thinking if it's if what Andrew Tate's doing is such a good way of like marketing an ideology, why do we not have one? Why like what where's the where's the populist socialist influencer? You know, is it like I is it because there's like Andrew Tate has 33 cars and if there was a socialist with something like that, it'd be hard to particularly relate to is it is it something to do with you know the the premise of socialism being people coming together and having one particular person being the or like leader of something to do with that feeling wrong i just i it feels like it's a method that works and it could be explored <laughs> lovely so the next person in the middle and then i will go to the person with the black t-shirt at the back Thank you. I'm entitled my agenda. Sarah Everard to police cells. Is there a new misandry? 
In this book, Smashing the Sexist System, there's a quote from Susan Faludi, author of Backlash, The Undeclared Against American Woman, where she says, a backlash against women's rights is nothing new. Indeed, it's a recurring phenomenon. It recurs every time women begin to make headway towards equality. In her follow-up book, Stift, The Betrayal of the American Man, she says male grievances seem hyperbolic, even hysterical. She could have been referring to the socialist writer, Ernest Balfour Bax, in his book, The Fraud of Feminism, published 1913, 110 years ago, where he wrote, any man who ventures to criticize the pretensions of feminism is actuated by motives of personal rancor, that is feelings of hate or anger against the female sex. In 1983, Rosalind Coward, author of Patriarchal Precedents, challenged the theory of patriarchy when she wrote, within Marxism, excuse me, within Marxism, the fact that the family was both central and vital and was the point where women were theorized meant that women were in fact subsumed to other theoretical and political objectives. What are these political objectives? In heterophobia, sexual harassment, and the future of feminism, Daphne Patai said radical feminism is a pathological view of the relations between the sexes. She also said that sexism, a feminism that has latched onto sexual harassment as a mean of bringing men to heal is, I believe, a feminism that will ultimately discredit women. Now, other books in this tradition include Joanna Williams, Woman vs. Feminism, Why We All Need Liberating from the Gender War. One minute Tommy left. Curry, The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood. Esther Villa, The Manipulated Man. Herb Goldberg, The Hazards of Being Male, Surviving the Myth of Masculine Privilege. Warren Farrell, The Myth of Male Power, Why Male Are, Why Males Are the Disposable Sex. Mary Cassian, The Feminist Mistake. Christina Hoff Sommers, Who Stole Feminism, How Women Have Betrayed Women. Helen Smith, Men on Strike, Why Men Are Boycotting Marriage, Fatherhood, and the American Dream, and Ariel Levi, Female Chauvinist Pigs, Women and the Rise of Branch Culture. I would also say that whilst Andrew Tate is a convenient hate symbol, the actual true liberators of men are Mel Fate and Jack Hammer, who, for instance, wrote the book, If Men Have All the Power, How Can't Women Make All the Rules? So having prefaced that, my question is, why does the last concept of female liberation rest upon a premise of female hyper-vulnerability, which fabricates a notion of male pathology whilst erasing male vulnerability? Thank you. I'm going to go to the black person with the black t-shirt um, at the back and then to the person with the blue um, jumper at the front. Person uh, with the black yeah, t-shirt. I just wanted to respond to the question about why don't, why don't we use sort of this method um, to raise class consciousness and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I have two sort of main points. One is that there are um, quite big sort of leftist co content creators, if you want to call them that, um, such as Hassan, um, who is this kind of streamer who also turned out to be a misogynist um, dickhead and uh, <laughs> um, and was spreading sort of like subversive misogynistic rhetoric um, through his streams where he was also talking about class consciousness, about labour power and about um, sort of like socialist history. Um, and it all came down to this like debate bro, like theory mindset, um, where it was all about destroying like the arguments of the um, of the opposition. And if that happened to be right wing or it happened to be left wing, it didn't matter as long as you were getting views and as long as you were like coming out as the most intellectual person in the room. Um, and I think the strength of so when, like, even if you don't have like that example, um, the strength of the sort of right wing tactic of having this like colder personality around one person or about one ideology, it is so identity based. Um, and that is something that Marxists often, you know, have to reject because it has to be like class based rather than um, young white men or um, young men who can't have sex. <laughs> um, so when you have like these these massive personalities who are going, um, you are the victim. You look this. You look this way. You act this way. You live in this way. Um, you are the victim, and this is why. And these are all your enemies. Um, you have a certain like the draw. Um, and I think Marxists have to avoid that even at our um, sort of recruitment detriment because that's not actually the ideology that we're fighting for. And it takes a little bit more work to be saying, um, yes, absolutely, you are being oppressed um, in all of these sort of intersectional ways, but it is because of this root cause. And it takes a little bit more time to convince someone of that rather than saying, um, you're a young white man, look how good you had it 100 years ago, look how shit your life is now. Um, so yeah, I don't think that we should be using those tactics because it's identity based and it goes kind of down a dark path, but also we do have people, um, who try and it's often a very diverse group rather than, than one, one minute um, left sort of piece now. Mm -hmm. oh, I have to breathe fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like on, 
um, on like YouTube or whatever, there are like, you know, 50 people for every um, one horrible right winger, but you've got demonetization, you've got being blocked for saying um, two leftist things because of the corporate of corporatization of like content sharing apps and stuff like that will block you if you're being too radical. Um, and also right wingers on these sort of platforms have more access to capitalizing off of what they're saying, you know, they're selling, they're selling books, they're selling platforms, they're selling pyramid schemes, get help schemes, all that kind of stuff. Where else the leftist um, content creators are more often, you know, lower, um, lower middle class and not capitalizing on as such. So there are lots of nuances to why we don't and we shouldn't and we're failing at. <laughs> going at this sort of um, mythology, so thanks. Thank you. I'm going to go to the person with the blue jumper there and then the, the person in the middle um, with the blue t-shirt, um, if that's all right. Yeah, thanks very much, Sophia. I think it's absolutely smashing meeting. Um, I think the um, point you make about kind of a false anti-capitalism in the, in, the, in the emerging radical right is a really interesting one. And it's also not like that's also not a new phenomenon. You talk about like misogyny, um, the the incel and Andrew Tate's being a new expression of kind of an old, an old bigotry. I think that um, you know the radical, you know the the right kind of painting themselves as radical anti system is also not is also not a new phenomenon either. I mean, you know, if we look back, Hitler was a you know at times you know spoke against against the system, but then it was also obviously joined up with a conspiracy that is being controlled by, of course, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Jewish kind of globalist thing. And it, you see how these things these things like link up. And I think you know we're seeing, aren't we, again that kind of like the the complete and utter crisis that the system is in the capitalist system is breaking down it can't like you know re you know it reproduce itself anymore and we're seeing an immense immense polarization um you know working class living standards are being seriously squeezed and now in the last couple of years it's not just working class living standards being squeezed there's like a ca catastrophe of working class living standards one in seven people in britain uh can't feed themselves they're in food insecurity and so like we can see that like you know the far right like dresses itself as like you know there's there's a you know an explanation for why your life is breaking down the system but in in reality they're repackaging old ideas reinforcing old bigotries you know equality has gone too far women need to get you know take the back seat we need, need to harken back to some kind of a glory a glory era of um you know american slash british slash whatever society and it's it used as an excuse to to attack and roll back all our gains and you know we have to you know thinking about that um you know the scapegoats whatever they are they are you know refugees they're you know women they're trans people the solution has to be you know building campaigns that fight fight sexism but you know, a minute left racism. sorry not five Thanks minutes so one minute um uh, and uniting across the class and that means uniting you know uniting with men to fight for fight sexism reuniting with working class men but that doesn't mean you know we accept <laughs> you know accept sexist ideas as a part of our project you know we have to fight to to weed them out to argue um uh, and to make sure that there's no there's no track with any of those ideas but we have to try and unite as a class to take on to take on the system and be that pole of attraction for those for those alienated alienated young men to be the pole of attraction for the people who are who are suffering because of that but get, you know our politics is politics of hope not of despair and, and blaming each other Thank you. I'm um, so I'm going to go to the middle the person in the blue shirt. Then after that, I'm going to go to the person with the gingham shirt at, right at the back. Quite a lot of information to take in. And I was hoping you could, you could clarify something. So in the last um, talk I was at about women's oppression and in this one, I've heard something along the lines of uh, the family unit was uh, is a social construct created for capitalism by capitalism. And I don't understand how this can be the case if there's if there's a part of the Old Testament referring to things that resemble the nuclear family, which is well over 2,000 years old. So I wanted to ask if there was some clarification on that. Mm -hmm. like Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go to the person with the gingham shirt right at the back, and then we're going to go to the person who um, has had their hand up diligently for so long with the water bottle. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, no, obviously, thanks so much, Sophia, um, for the lead off. That was really great. Um, I think one of the other things that's come out about Andrew Tate is, I don't know if people are aware, but Andrew Tate declared himself as a Muslim last year. And, yeah. and one of the things that's come out after this is like, um, 
I think some genuine concern from teachers or families who are seeing Muslim boys kind of accept his twisted version of Islam and kind of be bought into some of these uh, sexist ideas and so on. But I think, you know, you can see for young Muslim men particularly um, who experience Islamophobia, just how disenfranchised and alienated you can be and pissed off uh, at society. And, you know, people that are looking for some kind of power in a, in a society that is all the odds are stacked against you as a Muslim, um, you know, that, that Andrew Tate can kind of channel some of that anger. And I think, you know, Andrew Tate can tell, to, can tell Muslim uh, boys that their family, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, is in poverty or, or their parents don't have jobs or whatever, um, not because they're systematically discriminated against by the capitalist system, but because of, uh, uh, of like, uh, something to do with women and that 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 they're the ones that stealing the jobs or or feminists are the problem or blah 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 i don't even i can't even articulate his nonsense arguments um but i think obviously we have to say that andrew tate is no friend uh of, of muslim boys or muslims in general like you know we just saw a photo of him with tommy robinson who's just about the biggest muslim hater out there you know the 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 the, 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 the you know the leader of the english defense leave and, one minute and so left. on Oh God. Okay. Well, I think that Andrew Tate has actually converted to Islam because he thinks that he thinks that all Muslim men share his beliefs, um, and that he, you know, he thinks that sexism is inherent to Islam and that he's welcome there. And he also he says stuff like that he wants an Islamic ass woman. I don't know what that means, but I think for him it means that he wants an oppressed woman who's not going to speak up and is a victim to him. And I think we have to say that there's nothing inherent um, uh, to Islam. Uh, uh, there's nothing. There's no sexism is inherent to Islam, and that Islamophobia likes sex is you know pumped up from the top of society and yes some muslim boys can buy into andrew tate's arguments um just like how some uh, some feminists can accuse muslim women uh, of of being backwards because they wear the hijab and that they're not they're not fighting for women's oppression uh, and actively being against it and so on and i think obviously in the socialist workers party we reject all of this we actually see where sexism and all oppression comes from you know it's not just individuals and not just individual muslim men and so on but sexism is actually rooted in the system and it takes to to get rid of it. Um, so yeah, thanks. It's good now, yeah. Yeah, cool. Right. Um, I just wanted to touch on, and forgive me if it's already been touched on, but something I find interesting, and I don't think it'd be understated, is the sort of anti-capitalist rhetoric that Andrew Tate puts across. Um, and I think it's actually some of the points of view you put across is something that I would agree with. And I think many people in this room would agree with when he talks about things like you know wage slavery and the disparity between uh, rich bosses and people on minimum wage and things like that. The issue comes along with a lot of his other rhetoric is his solutions to it are, uh, in effect, capitalist is to become a better capitalist, essentially. And his popularity is essentially, um, I think, comes in a quite an oxymoronic kind of way in terms of that his popularity stems from the unpopularity of uh, capitalism as a system and uh, exploiting the, the working class sort of feelings of that, but also he also has the image of uh, uh, the sort of uh, model image of what a captus looks like, as, as Sophia touched on in, in, a, in a talk. And there's this sort of contradiction in, in, in how that appeals. So there's this underlying unpopularity of the capitalist system, but the capitalist materialist aspect of it, it um, is also still prevalent and, and popular. And um, just answer one of the questions that, that came across before, why the left doesn't use these kind of uh, uh, strategies and things like that. I mean, I think it was Marx that said himself that the prevailing ideas in society are those of the ruling class. And... Andrew Tate does put forward an analysis of capitalism that, like I said, many of us agree with, it's his solutions to capitalism um, or to essentially buy your freedom. And I think a lot of people may come across this um, in regular society as well, in terms of um, either become a better capitalist and buy your way out of it or, or be a revolutionary socialist and, and most likely be broken. <laughs> but that's the kind of dichotomy that a lot of people uh, One minute experience. Left. And um, I mean, he, he often talks about The Matrix coming after him and all this kind of thing. And uh, The Matrix uh, was one of my favorite films until this uh, bastard came along. But uh, he, he presents himself as a sort of Morpheus character of, if any of you have seen The Matrix, I'm sure most of you have. Um, but in reality, he's more like, I think the character was called Cypher, the guy who sells out to go back into The Matrix to eat his steak. He's no revolutionary. He's a false revolutionary, and he puts across this that even where I've seen demonstrations, I think it was in Greece or Cyprus or something like that, that were campaigning uh, for hundreds of people to free Andrew Tate. Now, uh, also, I just uh, very quickly, on his uh, conversion to Islam, 
I think he's also used it as a bit of a marketing tactic to, to you know, appeal to over a billion people uh, in, in the world. But also a lot of, uh, you know, young Muslims uh, uh, believe in that when you revert to Can you Islam, start to sum up now, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, when, when you revert to Islam, that you should be forgiven of any sins in your in your past life kind of thing. Um, obviously, the Romanian police don't seem to agree with that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the person um, at the front. And actually, I'm going to go to the person with the short sleeve black top. Yeah, I think in answer to the question of why is Andrew Tate so popular? Um, look, the easiest thing to say is he offers a really simplistic solution, doesn't he, to some quite confounding issues that face young people about things like gender identity, their place in the world and so on. But actually, he just reflects these age old ideas, you know, that people have talked about the family. I mean, you know, socialists would argue that actually the nuclear family that we talk about and the role that it plays, it predates capitalism. So we would argue that, um, you know, the family unit arose uh, when the first class divisions developed in society 2000 years or a little bit uh, longer. And as a result of this process, women's uh, you know, uh, women's role in society changed. These kind of largely egalitarian societies became one ones where women's oppression was was a feature of it. And this saw that care in society became focused around the sort of the sort of centralized family unit as we know it today. Um, it takes a particular form under capitalism. It doesn't look exactly like that. Um, but guess what? Like the role the the lives of most women, most working class women, are still about taking care of other people uh, through the family unit. Um, but this analysis, it offers us two things, I think. Um, it's, not, it's an optimistic analysis. It shows that women's oppression has not always existed. And if it hasn't existed before, we can build a world without it. But what it also does is it provides us an understanding of how class relations, how people relate to each other through classes, are central to our um uh, essential to our way to tackle uh you know women's women's oppression because look at why Tate is so popular right society is rotten look at the generation of people that he's trying to speak to this is a generation who are growing up poorer than their parents they don't feel like they're ever going to find a secure place to live the world is uh you know mired in climate uh, catastrophe and particularly for young men they're surrounded by these manifestations of a deeply sexist uh, society the idea that they're able to kind of navigate this when Tate is breathing down their necks offering a really simplistic solution actually it's about competition between men it's about competition and ownership of women uh you know the fact that they're able to navigate this at all um you know i think i think it's no surprise that there is a, a pool for tape but these ideas are contested i mean look at the does you know the school playgrounds where we saw teenage boys come out in support of uh sexist um school uniform policies you know these are the people that are supposed to be adhering to take kind of mindlessly when actually they're challenging lots of things that you know much older adults uh you know don't bat an eyelid at um i think socialists say that um you know women do not benefit from the difficulties that men face in society one minute left but also men don't benefit from women's oppression none of us benefit from this division and oppression within society um you know better mental health care for men would benefit every you know every working class person in society better child care or abortion rights would um would impact uh you know men in a positive in a positive way so Tate pedals division we have to focus on the politics of unity the actions of unity because that is the best way to challenge Tate and his his mates. Thank you. Um, so the person in the black top will be followed by the person with the purple dress um, in kind of the fourth row back. There we go. Lovely. Uh, thank you a lot for your presentation. It was wonderful. Uh, uh, I wanted to share a bit uh, an experience I uh, usually have when I speak about feminism and uh, a patriarchy uh, with um, some men colleagues or friends or who are not misogynistic or not incels but what i i uh, see is that uh, when i talk about feminism they don't feel included or the response is and what about us what about men oppressions blah blah, blah. Uh, which is very important it's not something to put on the side but it usually comes when i talk about 
women oppression as a response. Um, so yeah, they don't feel included in the feminism fight. Uh, and Mike, I think that brings me to a question that we might be able to answer. Uh, where, where does this come from? Uh, this clear separation that feminism uh, in some people's mind are for women. And how do we bring bring those men with us because we need them uh, and also to let them know that patriarchy is not it's not something good for them too uh, because I think going to um, how do you, sorry my English to get the misogynistic guy is going to be more complicated but to get the guy that doesn't really understand that patriarchy is not good for him also yeah how do we do that <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much so the person with the purple dress will be followed by um, the person with the green shirt in the front. Uh, thanks for the great lead off. I think that in terms of understanding Andrew Tate, I think just as much as understanding the, a lot of the things that people have gone into about the question of sexism and the history of sexism and why it's so prevalent in society is seeing Andrew Tate as one of an interconnected web of the far right and one of the many far right figures that exists. Um, I think that, you know, we saw kind of as a microcosm, his relationships with people, you know, Sophia showed us the photo of him um, hanging out with Tommy Robinson, incidentally, a person who he said uh, around a similar time when he was reverting to Islam, he said uh, that he stood with Tommy Robinson as he fought against the Islamification of the UK. But he also has relationships with basically every other important far right figure that exists from Alex Jones on Infowars, from probably the only person who's ever been fired from Infowars for being too racist, Paul Joseph Watson, um, <laughs> who was fired and now works for Breitbart, who said Jews should be wiped off the face of the earth, along with, you know, various other extreme anti-Semitic, racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, pro-Hitler diatribes. Um, you know, he's just come out in support of Nigel Farage in the last couple of days to say, you know, him and Nigel, you know, really share a brotherhood, you know, they're the two people who have been uh, penalised and thrown out of and excluded from the UK. You see that uh, him as a as a his relationships as a microcosm of that. But I think you see the same thing playing out in terms of the way that young people are attracted to the far right. So Sophia went through the kind of different divisions of the men's rights activists on the interview uh, internet, the pickup artists versus the men's rights activists, the incels. But it's not the case that people just you know some young person might be interested in a pickup artist, a pickup artist on the internet, and then end up becoming incels. Actually. Actually, this is a whole pipeline which leads to uh, far more extreme, far right Nazi um, ideology, not just extreme sexism. So I think that part of the question for anti-fascists and activists and socialists in the UK today and all around the world is not just the understanding of sexism that Sophia and other comrades have gone through, but is a question about how to fight against fascism and seeing all the interconnected One minute left, please. far right and fascist groups, whether it is the people uh, in places like Erskine campaigning against the rights of refugees to come into this country, uh, whether it's people uh, protesting against Drag Queen Story Hour, whether it is far right misogynists um, like Andrew Tate, who offer you know an easy in um, to the far right for a lot of young people, seeing that as interconnected, and as you know a number of comrades have said, is seeing the way that the you know not just how bad society is today, but also the extreme right wing ideology of the kind of mainstream neo liberal figures that run our society, how that provides such an open space for those right wing figures, and so I think that. The, there's an argument as well that the fight against Andrew Tate is definitely a fight against sexism, which is a fight that socialists have always participated in, but it's also a broader fight because it's a fight against the system of capitalism, which is uh, both, um, you know, ameliorating people's lives, pushing people's living standards down, but also opening up, um, you know, this, this massive space for the far right and for fascists to grow. And that's what Andrew Tate is part of. And that's what we're fighting against. Thank you. So after the person in the green shirt, I'm going to go to the person in the white top in about the fourth row, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll try and make this brief. Thank you very much, Sophia, that was a great talk. Um, I wanted to re respond a little bit to a comment or, or a point that was made earlier, um, where there seemed to be this idea that there are a lot of female writers, socialist writers that are very anti-men. Um, and I think this is not necessarily a matter of who has it worse, men or women? We we know that we live in a system that oppresses people due to, in order to exploit them, oppresses people in any way it can in order to exploit them. So therefore, men will also be in some way or another exploited. They will be forced into a box. It's not a matter of who has it worse. 
uh, I would argue women has it work have it worse because they are put into an even smaller box and they're oppressed in many different ways that men aren't in this case. I'm not saying that men benefit from it, but you will see that sexual assault is lower in male populations and it is higher in female populations. Sex work is higher amongst female populations. So women are exploited through and they're exploited and they're oppressed um sexually they're objectified in ways that men are not uh angela davis has a great book about this women racing class um where you can see this this distinct this distinction in the form of oppression but the point is that capitalism as a system is not looking out for anyone's anyone's health or anyone's well-being it's trying to reach profit so trying to pretend that um oh us as socialists we really hate men we but we we we're calling, we're patholo pathologizing um, men's thought processes is ridiculous. Misogyny is a pathology. It's a disease in the system, just like the system itself is diseased. It doesn't work. So Andrew Tate is simply sort of commercializing this and is, has managed to find an audience. It's not a new audience. His ideas, again, like Sophia said, are not new. Um, but he's managed to find a way in which he can sell this to a larger group of people and and, and pretend that, yeah, he's anti-establishment, but instead he's just finding his market. And like someone around over there said, um, he's finding uh, one a, minute yeah, now. He's finding a, an easy solution to a complicated problem, just like the Tory government is finding an easy solution for its system by blaming refugees, by blaming asylum seekers, by blaming black people. It's not a surprise that it's happening. And I don't think saying that oh but men are oppressed too is actually the way that we're going to solve this thank you so um after the person with the white t-shirt i'm going to go to the person with the lavender vest um at the front yeah thanks sorry my brain's melting slightly i'm sure everyone else is melting as well but yeah um thank you a lot sophia and i think it's really important we're having this meeting because i don't think we can you know just sit and talk about it and think oh well that was that was brilliant we've now got to go out and implement these arguments in the world to tackle people like andrew tate um and his cronies and i think the question that the comrade here asks is a really important one how do we you know make sure this fight is a fight for everyone and i think you know it's it's starting by looking at the world that we live in because like you know um you know, if I was attacked by someone on the right, I would say, yes, I'm a feminist. But I think actually, fundamentally, I'd, I'd identify as a socialist because what I'm fighting for is a world that's better for women, a world that's better for black people, a world that's better for trans people and a world that's better for men as well. We're fighting for a world that's better for everyone. So I think we have to make the argument that actually we shouldn't um, you know, organise around these things based on our identity, you know, like it's women versus men or black people versus white people. We have to see it rooted in the system and then organise together as a class. Like, you know, we've heard earlier that I don't think men do benefit from women's oppression. I don't think it's good that, you know, women are, are kept in the home and then these pressures are put on men, you know, to have two weeks worth of paternity pay. And then, you know, they, they can't spend any time with their children or, you know, when women die because they don't have access to abortion, it's working class men's, you know, sisters and wives and brothers and so on. So, oh, sisters. And yeah, you know, you get what I mean. You know, th th these are class issues um and i think we have to argue um that you know we're stronger when we, we when we're united because of that um because our oppression is rooted in the system so i might like i said my brain's melting a little bit but we, we we've got to make the argument that these these issues aren't based on identity they're based on the system that we live in and therefore it's a class solution and therefore it matters to everyone that we overthrow that system because you know when you when you look at the type of system that we live in one where we're totally alienated aren't we marx talked about how you know as you know as human beings the thing that's making us human is our labor power and under capitalism we've got absolutely no control over our lives we don't control you know um what we do in work we don't control you know what time we go to work we don't control the relationships that we have around um us because of that lack of con control in society it's the bosses and the ruling classes one minute that, left that are in uh, control of that yeah thank you um so i think you know the reason that people like andrew tate managed to you know push through so much is because the world is shit like we've heard the world offers nothing for anyone and what we're fighting for is a world where we do have control it's not that men are the king of his castle and you know his wife is his you know sort of servant we're actually fighting for a world where we have complete control over our lives and production in society we have a say on how things are run we have a say on what we want to do uh with, with the resources we've got in society um and finally i think um, you know, we have to, uh, sorry, completely um, go up against those ideas uh, of gender roles in society. How many men have been told to man up or grow some balls? These are things that we have to be standing against. We know that, uh, you know, men's mental health is a question, um, but we're totally alienated from each other. We're, we're taught to see each other in competition, men versus women. That's what oppression and Andrew Tate and people like that want. Um, 
you know, even Andrew Tate is forcing competition between men. How are you going to be a billionaire unless you're going to exploit other men? You know, so he's talking about competition constantly, and we have to, you know, question Can that. You up now, please, yeah, comrade. We we're uh, yeah together as a class. So class. thank you. Um, so after the person with the purple top, I'm going to go to the person with the grey um, t-shirt with their hand up. Yeah. Hi, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of my personal experience and my uh, interpretation of that, I guess. I am both uh, back home. I work as a substitute teacher primarily with middle schoolers, which is kids ages like 12 to 14, generally uh, prime Andrew Tate demographic and uh, Additionally, my brother back home is 13 and prime Andrew Tate demographic. Uh, I think one thing that uh, I guess bolsters these sort of uh, toxic ideas for young boys is a lot of them fall within sort of like hyper masculine stereotypes, like saying that. Andrew Tate is hyper masculine isn't exactly uh, some big revelation, but uh, I think ideas that are associated with uh, leftism, like kindness and empathy are seen as inherently feminine and therefore lesser, while ideas of like bolstering billionaires and success in capitalism is uh linked quite a bit with masculinity and so i think that uh makes it harder to uh i guess get uh get leftist ideas in ma in masculine spaces that's all lovely thank you um after uh, so we're gonna have maybe Time for two more speakers now. So after the person with the grey t-shirt, I'm going to go to the front with the person with the red stripy t-shirt. And we'll see where we're at. we are after that. Cheers. Yeah, I wanted to come back on the person who questioned about the nuclear family because, you know, quite often in these meetings, you're going to hear people say the nuclear family family isn't natural. It hasn't always existed. Human beings have lived in different societies, different, or different relationships for a long time. I realise this is a Marxism conference and not archaeology, so I will bore you to death in the bar afterwards if you want more details about it. But what I would say right now is um, that the nuclear family is shoved down our throats every single day on every tele programme, every advert. Please do not put that image back on the screen again because it made me want to vomit. We're told constantly that this is how we're supposed to be. Um, there's, there's constant ideological pressure about it as if you know it, they have to keep reminding us to try and live in this way um, but there's actually loads and loads of evidence that in the past we have lived in very different relationships the, the problem is though archaeology and anthropology are both products of capitalism they develop at the same time and they absorb and replicate the ideas of capitalism so what we got is um, archaeologists discovering stuff about the past and anthropologists going and meeting other communities or other cultures but they try to explain things in terms of how capitalism works. So they look at evidence of how people lived in the past and say, oh, well, um, this is a room in a house that's got cooking implements and things. It must have been where women did their work. This is a part of a building where animals were kept or pottery was made or something fiery burning and metally was done. That must have been where men were. And they take the ideas of capitalism and try and shove it onto the past. And I know what I'm on about because I am an archaeologist. Um, <laughs> anthropologists similarly have done the same kind of thing. They replicate the, the ruling, ideal, ruling, ruling ideas of the society we're in now and try and force it onto the past. And the Flintstones cartoon, if you've ever seen it, drives me crazy. It is so terrible. But it is taking that that those nuclear families and trying to make it make out that we've always lived this way. There is lots and lots of evidence that we haven't always lived this way. And just one example, the hunter gatherers, right? The term itself drives me crazy. It really upsets me because it's a very binary term and it makes it seem as if men did one thing and women did another. And there's no prizes for guessing that they always think that men do the hunting and women do the gathering. There's actually not a lot of evidence that people's lives were gendered in one this way. One minute ago. Thank you. They weren't always gendered in this way. There's plenty of evidence, actually, if you look at it and you don't 
come at it as a sexist, that people were not forced into these specific gender roles and that people could move around in terms of their activities and their at different parts of their life or um, that they would do different things. There's loads of evidence of that, um, but uh, many archaeologists have not wanted to admit this. Um, so I come back to this, what I started off with, the, the nuclear family seems natural to us because we're told constantly that this is how we should live. They wouldn't have to tell us Stop constantly up now, that please. this is how we should live if it was natural. We'd just do it. Um, do believe that it is created to serve capitalism and it's not in our interest to perpetuate this nonsense. But I'll bore you in the bar later if you want to know more. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I think the, la the last speaker will be the person at the front. Um, yes. <laughs> Oh, well, look, thanks, Sophia. That was such a fantastic speech. And I think it's right that we're locating Andrew Tate in wider society because there's been a lot of concerns raised about his impact, particularly in schools and on young men. And it's almost could be interpreted, well, OK, we got rid of Andrew Tate and it would all be OK. And I think that's not the case. He's coming out of, in the most extreme version, a society uh, that shapes him and others in that way. And I think it's right what the person at the back was saying. He presents as anti-establishment, but he very much reflects absolute pro-capitalist ideas. Capitalism is a system driven by competition for profit. If you watch any of Andrew Tate's things, he's driven by competition, even between men themselves. You know, they're paid to go into his university thing and then they're put to have a cage fight with each other. You know, they've got to compete against each other. Success is measured through material wealth alone. He reinforces the idea of hierarchy between men with women at the bottom um, and division as well, like I say, between uh, men and women, but also between men themselves. These are all all characteristics of a capitalist society, a class society that we live in, he takes them to an even more extreme form, just as he does with his sexist ideas. When he strips it back, his people around him say, yeah, women have got to cook, clean and have sex. Well, basically, that's a very, very basic stripped down version of how a family is meant to function, you know, looking after uh, the workers or whatever and procreating. He's taking it to a very extreme um, thing in that way. And I think then for us, if we see him as, as part of that, it's like, well, what is our response to it? And I think we have to also say that um, it's not the case that people just read or come across ideas on the internet and just believe them. Do you know what I mean? They interact with a, a wider experience and our responses are about how do we have a collective response? And I just think when people talk about a lot of the worries of young people buying into them or whatever, I think about the big movements that have had young people at the heart of them coming together. Think about climate change kicked off by school students, the uh, climate know. strikes, think about Black Lives Matter, a really young movement of bringing people together in a, a different way, a collective response, rather than sitting, feeling isolated, looking at ideas that actually actually reinforce some of the worst parts of society. And I think that when we talk about our solutions, it is about how we do that. And I think we have to, because look, I hope Andrew Tate goes down for good. I hope we never have to see him again. But actually, if we don't get rid of a system that generates those ideas, there will be more Andrew Tates, because there already is. They're the ideas in society that we're fed. We've got to put a different solution, and that's a unity and collective struggle, where men and women fight together for a class response against the real people who are enemies at the top. Thank you. Um, and I just want to apologise to everyone who didn't get called. It was a bit, obviously, I think a lot of people had a lot to say. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more discussion we can be doing afterwards. So talking about going to the bar afterwards. So um, just one announcement. So Soweto Kinch will be playing at the Mully's Bar right after this meeting. Um, he is an award winning saxophonist and MC. So so head to that after this meeting. So um, I'll go now back to Sophia to sum up for about 10 minutes. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for the for the discussion uh, and for sitting through what is an incredibly hot room. For uh, the temperature of the room reflects my blood boiling when I was researching for this meeting. <laughs> no, I think I want to just come firstly to the question that was asked about the family. I think somebody's also already responded to it, but look, I, I think it's important. That, you know, we ask these questions. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll definitely be at Molly's bar afterwards. So, if people want to come and have a chat about anything I said, um, please do. I think firstly, the idea of family being a social construct. Um, 
that's not what, what we say. Um, sorry if it came across that way. The family is very much like a material thing that exists in society, right? It's not like magicked up, nor is it like all the capitalists and the bosses are like sat in a room secretly sort of thinking, all oh, right, like, okay, how are we going to get these women to have kids? Let's force them all into a family. You know, there are ideas that rise, arise from the material realities of it. But a social construct, I think, implies something that simply exists because of uh, because of ideas or because of societies. It's like an immaterial thing, right? It's like an idea, whereas the family is very material and the economic function that it plays is, is, is an incredibly real one in the driving force of capitalism. Uh, that being said, uh, as, as the previous person said, it was, the family is not a product of, it, it's not, it wasn't invented by capitalism. Um, it far predates capitalism. As people said, the family really comes about with the first sort of settled agriculture, um, when people start to farm the land, have private property, and actually when a surplus is produced. Um, once a surplus was started to be produced in society, the question of ownership came in. Who controls the surplus? Who works on the land to produce the surplus? With this, you see the rise of class society, but we say you also see the rise of women's oppression in the form of the family. Because for the first time in society, not only was there a need to have more children, to work on the land, to produce more of a surplus, but the question of monogamy comes into it because the men who own the surplus they now got an interest right they want that ownership to go down and pass along their lineage and that's where you see the family start to emerge in society um, this far far predates capitalism talking tens of thousands of years but capitalism inherits the family right and actually you can see time and time again why it needs it if capitalism didn't need the family, it would have done away with it a long time ago. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution, you nearly saw the breakdown of the nuclear family under capitalism. Everyone was working in the factories. Uh, the average age of someone, I think, in, in Bethnal Green was like 16 years old. The average age of someone in Manchester was 17 years old. You know, people weren't having kids because everyone was forced into the factory floor. They shared beds and so on. And actually, the kind of look far-sighted bosses and uh, capitalists, they were like, oh, shit like very soon we ain't gonna have anyone to work and make our profits for us and they introduce things like the family wage push women back into the home they reinstill these ideas of the family so you can see that it's something that the ruling class had to save because it is essential to capitalism but capitalism didn't create it it learned it but it isn't very much a part of that system so hope, hopefully that that was uh, clear and i think as well then when you begin to understand the class elements of women's oppression it can bring you back to the question about what do we say to our male friends who say, what about us? Because you can say, this is about you. You know, this is about a system that divides people into classes. I think that's quite an important thing. To be honest, I don't talk about feminism much. Uh, people may or may not have guessed. I like to talk about socialism and Marxism, right? I think that's a better way of understanding. I think feminism can be a useful framework to start things and to have conversations, but I always try and draw that conversation to its most radical conclusion, right? It's that, you know, it is not men that oppress women. Women. Men do not benefit from women's oppression. Working class men do not benefit from the fact that them and their partners have to work free jobs and they have to pay ridiculous amounts in childcare. You know, th th men don't benefit from these things. There are some men that benefit from it, but there's some women that benefit from it too. Theresa May, she benefits, right? She benefits from a system that has class, class exploitation and oppression at the heart of it. And I think that's quite an important thing because when you talk about socialism, it's not then cancelling off someone's rights you know it's not like i only want to focus on women's rights and i don't care about the struggles that men face to be honest the only people i want to see miserable in society are the ruling class uh when we steal all their money and take their land <laughs> off of their right That's, they're the only people i want to see like crying right and i think it brings it back to that question of the anti-capitalist rhetoric that some people have said karl marx is quite an important quote he said that if an essence and appearance coincided there would be no need for science and i think what he means by that is that capitalism masks the exploitation that we face it hides it it tells people that you have a choice in society you choose to work your shit job you choose to have this life this is stuff that andrew tate says right you could be rich capitalism hides the exploitation that it makes all of us um that all of us have to envisage or experience and those 
ideas of capitalism, the ideas of the ruling class that people have said, it shapes people's consciousness. People have contradictory consciousness. Some people will have ideas that don't actually benefit their material position in society. And I think we have to start picking apart those ideas. Because as we said, these ideas are not fixed. Um, people's minds can be changed and they can be changed through struggle. You know, people talked about the sort of links to the alt-right that it has. Andrew Tate and incels is a conspiratorial philosophy, if you can call it a philosophy, right? It is conspiratorial. So are the COVID deniers. So are the fascists. There is a conspiratorial element about trying to explain the world without actually attacking anything that's material. Marxism is a science. Marxism is a method to try and understand capitalism and what is going on around us. And it gives us the solutions to a way out. It's a way for us to explain this is why you're miserable under capitalism. You know, why do you hate Mondays? It's because of alienation, right? You know, all of these things, Marxism can explain to us why people have these things in, in the world with very real solutions. But yeah, and also it gives us important solutions. And we know actually that capitalism means crisis. People have said it, it means a crisis time and time again. And that's why we have to get rid of it because otherwise we will keep suffering look i fight against sexism not just because i think sexism is wrong of course it is but i also fight against sexism and women's liberation because it is fundamental to the workings of capitalism and that's the thing that i eventually want to see gotten rid of in society today and look i think that one of the contributions i might have misunderstood you right but i don't think so if i did i apologize but then I don't think when we talk about women's liberation, it's not about assuming a female vulnerability or a male pathology in any way. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think there are biological roots to these things, actually. I think, you know, we live in a system that can make women vulnerable. I don't think women accept it passively. Uh, look at, you know, the women in this room, we fight back against it time and time again. There aren't these biological roots that we have to have in society. So if we, I ain't got no time how much, I don't know how much time I've got left, but I'm on my final point. <laughs> huh? That is perfect. The first question, which was a good one. Why don't we have our own Andrew Tate? Well, to be honest, I'm too busy on picket lines to like be starting shit on like YouTube stuff. So, I mean, I would do it, but I'm unavailable, right? But like, no, I don't. That's a joke. You know? no, um, look, firstly, I think there are figures on the left, right? I mean, don't know if anyone saw the cue for Ken Loach in the session before, right? Think about how many people we've, at, we've got here at Marxism Festival, you know? We do have people that we want to see in society. But like I said, you know, actually, I don't think online is the space in which we are going to change the world. I don't think video, I think where we're going to change the world is in the streets. It's not in Parliament either. It's in struggles. It's on protest it's fighting against things that's where the left are that's where the revolutionaries are we're too busy to be on reddit or 4chan and things like that that's where revolutionaries have to fight in the streets i'm not saying that you know if you if you don't do that you are if you do do that and you are a revolution you're not proper i'm not saying that right but you know i think as well though there is a point to be had because it does sometimes feel like those right-wing ideas dominate yeah so we do need to be louder. I think we do need to be bigger as well. We need to have more people who want to talk about the ideas of socialism. And that's why it's not going to surprise you, but I'm going to finish by saying, if you like what I've said today, if you agree, I think you should join the Socialist Workers Party. Why do we ask you to join? We ask you to join because we want to be bigger. We think that there is a world to win. Uh, James Connolly says, you know, oh, it's like, you know, we only want the earth, right? I think that is what we have to fight for. The Socialist Workers Party is an organization that is, that is led by revolutionary women. But it's not just revolutionary women. We fight arm in arm with our trans comrades, with our, um, with our non-binary comrades, and with our male comrades, because we think together that is how we're going to win that fight. And I think it's an important thing that we have to say. Now, look, being a part of the SWP, I can't guarantee you much, right? Unlike Andrew Tate, I'm not going to teach you how to invest, invest in crypto. Can't even explain to you, to be honest, where it is. Uh, if you are a revolutionary, your chances of owning a Bugatti probably are pretty slim. Uh, 
you're not going to get rich and famous but what you are going to do is be part of a party that fights against the toxic world you're going to be part of an organization that actually fights against the system that produces someone like andrew tate and actually for all of the reasons that we speak about at marxism festival here this weekend for all of those reasons that is a world that we have to fight and uproot so if you want to be part of that fight then i think you should join the socialist workers party but yeah thanks as well